And please join me in prayer. Oh Lord, it is all about you and we're so grateful that we can come to worship you, to be in the presence of the holy God. Only thou art holy. There is none beside thee. Perfect in power, in love and purity. You are such an amazing God. And now we open our hearts and our minds to you that we might learn more of you, be instructed more of you and your ways. Lord, please mold us and shape us by the power of your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Vance Havner uh, died a few years ago, but he was this uh, southern preacher from the United States. If you know anything about southern preachers, they kind of had this particular way about them. And he made many uh, keen observations about life and about church life and he also had a very clever way with words he could put words together in a very unique way to drive the point home and so this is what he once said regarding worship specifically worship services see if you agree with what he said he said too many of our worship services begin at 11 o'clock sharp and end at 12 o'clock dull Now, I don't know if you found that to be true in your experience. Probably some of us have, although hopefully not in this particular uh, church. But why is it, though, that church services sometimes can be rather dull? Or why is it that one adjective that is used quite often by people in describing a worship service is the word boring? Well, today I want to speak about how we worship. Last week was why we worship. Today, how we worship. What does worship look like? Or what should it look like? Maybe if we have a clear understanding of uh, what worship is supposed to look like, and then we worship accordingly, then our worship services will never be dull or boring. First, though, just a quick review uh, from last week. And we began by defining worship, and we saw that the word worship simply means to declare the worth of something. And, of course, it's only natural to declare the worth of what is good or excellent. If we are attending a concert and we're caught up in the beauty of the music, then at the conclusion of the uh, concert, we respond with our applause maybe even with a standing ovation. Through this action, we are declaring the worth, the beauty, the excellence of the music. We naturally praise and give tribute to what is excellent. There is, of course, no one and nothing more excellent, more worthy of praise than God. When we've taken the time to learn of God, to learn of of the greatness and the majesty of His character, to learn of the wonders of His love and grace, then the only natural response is to declare God's worthiness, His excellence, through our worship and praise. And we do so with joy. Again, like the concert, as you listen to the music, it brings joy to your heart as you hear the beauty of the music and then your joy is brought to fruition as you respond with your applause. Your joy would somehow be cut short if you did not applaud to this great concert. And the same thing with God. We have joy simply in learning more of the wonder and greatness and love of God for us. And then our joy is completed as we celebrate that through the act of worship. So worship should always be a joyful activity that we engage in. So worship begins with the knowledge, both the intellectual knowledge as well as the experiential knowledge of who God is. And what he's done for us. I mean, just think. God is the creator. The maker of heaven and earth. He formed each one of us while we were still in our mother's womb. 
In Jesus Christ, He came to us to make Himself known to us in a way that we can understand. And more importantly, He came to us in Jesus to reveal the fullness of His love for us as Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we can have life. The Holy Spirit abides with us now to comfort us, to guide us, to empower us. One day Christ will return and we will spend eternity in the presence of God and we will enjoy the fullness of His love forever. Worship begins with God, with who He is, with all that He has done for us and all that He yet will do for us. And when we grasp that, then we will naturally want to respond to this great God with praise and adoration, with thanksgiving and awe. In doing so, we declare the worthiness, the greatness of God. Just as we respond to the orchestra with our applause, so we respond to God with our worship. Furthermore, we should see worship as a privilege, not simply as a duty, as something that we are supposed to do. No, in worship, God invites us into His presence. Jesus said, whenever two or three of us gather in His name, He is there with us. So imagine when we gather here, as we have now, we have gathered in the presence of the living God. What a privilege that is. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we come on Sunday mornings with with open hearts and minds expecting to encounter God through the act of worship? So that's what worship is, really. Knowing and declaring the worthiness of God. Our question for today is, how do we do that? If worship services sometimes seem dull, could it be that we are missing something? I mean, how could it be dull or boring to be in the presence of the living God? Is there something we are supposed to be doing that maybe we are not doing? Well, the first thing and really the most important thing to understand about worship is that worship is active. It's not passive. Worship is something that we do. It's not something that is done to us or for us. The late Bob Weber uh, was a college and seminary professor of theology in the U.S. and he wrote a book some years ago now, but perhaps some of you read this book. It's entitled, Worship is a verb. And that really captures the essence of worship. Worship is not a noun, a thing. No, worship is a verb. It's active. It's something that we do. It's not about sitting in the pew and having something done for you or to you. For example, let's look at Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. We also read this uh, passage last week, but I'd like to read it again today. And please note the verbs as I read this passage that invites us to worship. So Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before Him with thanksgiving and extol Him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In His hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to Him. The sea is His, for He made it and His hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. Did you catch all of those verbs? Come, let us sing, let us shout, let us come, let us extol. Come, let us bow down in worship, let us kneel before the Lord. Clearly, worship is not about something that happens to us. It is something that we do. Worship is active, not passive. 
Unfortunately, in many churches today, the congregation has been reduced to simply being a group of spectators. Maybe this is due in part to the fact that we live in an entertainment age. You know, we're used to watching television, or we go to a play, we go to a concert, we go to a movie, we go to an athletic event. And what do we do in such settings? Nothing. We just sit there and watch others perform. And so we can easily come to a worship service with the same expectation. We will sit, in some cases stand, and we will watch others. The preacher, the worship team, a soloist, anyone who is taking part in the service. And we will watch them, quote, perform. All too often, the congregation has been reduced to simply a group of spectators. But that's not the way worship is supposed to be. In worship, the congregation is not the audience for whom a few worship leaders perform. Rather, everyone here is an active participant. And those who are up front are merely prompters. We prompt or help everyone else to actively engage in worship. But the worship leaders do not do the worshiping for the people. Furthermore, it is God, not the congregation, who is the audience. Now, when I say that God is the audience, I don't mean that God is watching us and we must somehow try to impress God with a good performance. Rather, God is the audience in the sense that he is the recipient of our worship. Worship is done to God. Worship is done for God. And so Psalm 95 was not inviting us to come so that we would be inspired or that our spirits would be lifted up. No, it invites us to come before God to extol Him in song and to sing for joy to the Lord. And so worship is an act an act of love and sacrifice that is offered up to God in response to His greatness and His love. Now, if we are all participants in worship, then we all must be actively engaged in every aspect of the worship service. And so, when we are singing, all of us, Regardless of our singing ability or lack thereof, and I don't have very much when it comes to singing, I can confess that, but all of us should join in. Because through the hymns and through the choruses, we are declaring the worthiness of God. We are responding to the greatness of God. Do we believe that God is worthy, that He is our Creator, that Jesus is our Savior? Well, then let's praise God for that. Now, I know that there are some who just don't like to sing. But that's not the point. (laughs) The point is that God is worthy of being praised. And through music, we are able to offer God our worship. Psalm 147 verse 1 reminds us how good it is to sing praises to God. Why this emphasis on music, on singing praises to God? Well, maybe it's because music is the natural expression of human joy and love. Music communicates at a level deeper than the words themselves. Uh, Singing has a way of magnifying the meaning of the words. We could even say that music is the language of the soul. For instance, I can say these words. O Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. Now, I can say those words, and yes, those words are true, and those words are meaningful, 
But when we sing those words in that great hymn, How Great Thou Art, it adds a whole new depth and richness and meaning and power to the words. That's why we sing. And when we sing, excuse me a second here, and when we sing, besides uh, using our voices, we also must be actively engaged with our minds. Once when we were in my hometown, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, I had to take a, a, a big load of clothes to the dry cleaners. I have a, a friend from childhood, even like before kindergarten. Uh, we've known each other, and he and his family own a dry cleaning business, so that's where I always take our dry cleaning clothes when I'm back home. And so one day I had to take a bunch of clothes. It was a good-sized pile, so I put all the all these clothes in a, a big brown plastic trash bag. And then I set the bag by the door so I wouldn't forget it when I left later that day because sometimes I forget things. And so, later it's time to go. I went to the door, I grabbed the bag, and uh, got in the car and drove to the dry cleaners. And when I got to the dry cleaning shop, I placed that bag of clothes on the counter and opened it up so that my friend could take the clothes and put them into the bag that they used there. But when I opened up that brown plastic trash bag, what do you suppose was in it? (laughs) Trash. I had forgotten that I had also set beside the door a bag of trash that needed to go out that day. And when I left, I wasn't thinking, I wasn't paying attention. I just went to the door and grabbed a bag and off I went, but it was the wrong bag. Well, let me tell you, I felt pretty stupid taking a bag of trash to the dry cleaners. But my friend told me, believe it or not, that other customers had done the same thing. In fact, for some customers, it was even worse because my friend's business has a pickup service. And so you don't have to take your clothes there. They have a van and they'll come to your house and get your clothes. And if you're not going to be at home when they come, you can just put your clothes in a bag and set them outside by your front door. And it's a safe community. You can do that. Well, some of their customers have had laundry pickup and trash pickup scheduled on the same day. And they got their bags confused. They set their bag of laundry out for the uh, trash collector and their bag of trash somewhere else for the laundry man. And by the time they realized their mistake, it was too late. And the clothes were gone for good. Not a good thing to do. Although I suppose it's a quick way to clean out your closet if it's getting a bit cluttered. You know, there are some things that we can do without engaging our minds. We can wash the dishes and we don't really need to think about what we're doing. When we're brushing our teeth, we don't need to be thinking about what we're doing. But when it comes to taking clothes to the dry cleaners, we better think about what we're doing. And when it comes to worship, we must actively engage our minds throughout the whole worship service. Because if we just kind of put it on autopilot, then we are going to miss the opportunity to worship. We must be thinking about what we're doing if it is to be authentically worshipful. And so... When we sing that great hymn as we've already done this morning, Holy, 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 we don't sing that mindlessly, just mouthing the words. No, in our minds we are meditating on the holiness of God and we are worshiping Him for that. When we sing how great Thou art, we are considering the greatness of God and we are praising Him for that. When we sing, great is thy faithfulness, we should be reflecting on God's faithfulness and rejoicing in that. We don't sing just to sing, but rather through our singing, we worship God for who He is and for all He has done. And that means that we must think about what we are singing so that then our singing becomes an act of worship springing from our hearts. Our singing then highlights 
the greatness and the love and the grace and the holiness of God. And then there are some songs that rather than being about God are actually addressed to God. In essence, they are prayers set to music. And so when we sing, change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. We sing that as a prayer. With our voice, we are singing and in our mind and in our spirit, we are praying that God would change our hearts so that we could become more and more like him. When we sing, you are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due, I stand in awe of you. When we are singing that, and we're singing that to God, then we are thinking about those words and we are praising God because He is beautiful beyond description. He is too marvelous for words. He's wonderful beyond comprehension. We engage our minds as we are singing. If we don't sing with that attitude, then there's really no point in singing at all. I mean, after all, God is surrounded by angels who are constantly praising Him with perfect pitch and in perfect harmony. God doesn't need to hear a nice song from us. But what God desires is that we would sing to Him from our hearts. So whether we are singing hymns about God or singing choruses to God, it's important that we not only sing, but that through our singing, We really do worship God. We must enter into the message of the words and let those words become the response or the prayer of our own heart. Let me just say one more thing about singing. We are, as you know, an international church, and so we come from all kinds of different backgrounds. Some of us come from a more traditional background, and so we prefer to sing hymns the time-tested favorites that have been appreciated for many years. Others of us prefer to sing the contemporary choruses. We relate better to that style of music. So, what do we do in a church like ours? Well, since Scripture neither dictates nor restricts us to a particular style of worship music, well, then we shouldn't do that either. And because we are a diverse congregation with different preferences and desires when it comes to music, then we need to try as best we can to include these different styles of music in our worship service and not restrict our worship to just one style of music. In this context, it's good for us to hear what Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. There he said, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. God's will for us as a congregation doesn't really have to do with what kind of music we sing hymns or choruses, either are fine as long as we are singing them from our hearts. But God's will for us, clearly, is that we would not look out for and that we certainly would not push for only our interests. But as this passage says, we would look out for the interests of others. This obviously means that we look out for the interests of those who differ from us. And so, in the context of worship, we all need to consider the interests of others, the preferences, the desires of our brothers and sisters in Christ who maybe have a different taste in music than we do. This is one way that we show love to our brothers and sisters. It's a way of communicating that everyone here is important. 
This is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. As that passage from Philippians 2 goes on to speak about, Jesus is our example in this. For when he went to the cross to die for us, he certainly was not looking out for his own interests or seeking his own desires. No, he was looking out for our interest. He placed our interest above his own, even at the cost of his life. As this passage then makes clear, we are called to follow Jesus in this regard, to consider not just our own interest, but also the interest of others. And so when we sing a hymn or a song, and and maybe it's not from the style of music that you prefer, I would ask you to enter in and sing anyway. For in the first place, God is always worthy of our worship, no matter what style of music we are singing. And second, I would encourage you to enter in and sing for the sake of your brothers and sisters who do appreciate that kind of music. Perhaps there'll be some times when you just need to to silently pray, God, this, this really isn't my favorite kind of music, but it is for others here. And so for their sake and for your glory, help me to worship you anyway. And remember, Later in the service, there will probably be others in your place considering your interests and your preferences as music and music as we sing what you prefer. The unity of the church and our love for one another is far more important than the style of music that we sing. So how we worship involves more than just an outward style of worship or the particular things that we do, how we worship also includes having a Christ-like attitude of preferring one another in love and looking out for the interest of others. So I hope that we all will follow the example of Jesus in this regard. Well, back to the fact that worship is active. That's true for all the elements of the worship service. And so there are times when, as a congregation, we're not singing, but maybe the worship team or a soloist is singing a special number. And when that happens, the purpose of it is not just for us then to sit back and be entertained. No, it's to help us worship through their singing. As they're singing, again, our minds are to be actively engaged throughout the whole service. So we are considering the message of that song. And then we respond by by maybe thanking God for whatever it is that they're singing about or praising Him, whatever the message of that song is about. We enter into that. When the Scripture is being read, when prayers are being offered, when the sermon is being, being proclaimed, again, the same thing is true. We must be active listeners. Our minds must be engaged with what is taking place. I mentioned a moment ago Bob Weber, and in an article uh, about worship, he wrote of an experience he once had uh, along these lines, and, and this is what he said. Some time ago, he was in a worship service, some time ago, as the Scripture was being read during a service, my mind wandered to something else. Well, I'm sure we can all relate. My mind wandered to something else. Then I heard a woman behind me saying softly, Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, yes. These words drew me up sharply. And I said to myself, Bob, listen. Something really important is being said. I had forgotten to be intentional about my listening to open my ears and my heart to the voice of God present through the reading of the Scripture. We need to call on our people, the faithful and the seekers alike, to listen attentively and intently. Worship is active. And during those elements of the worship service, when some are leading and the rest are basically listening, even then our listening is to be active. Our minds should be engaged and we should be carrying on a silent conversation, worshiping God through what is being proclaimed. 
The same thing is true when we celebrate communion. Now, I know if you've been in the church for many years, we can easily just go through the motions of communion without really thinking about the meaning of it. But as we eat the bread and as we drink the cup, we need to be reflecting on what what Christ did for us, how he died for our sins and then rose from the dead, conquering death for all of us. And as we reflect on that, we need to thank God for the depth of His love and mercy. And even the offering is a time to actively worship. Even if you're one who maybe doesn't give here, but maybe you do that online or how, still, when the offering is being collected, we should actively be worshiping. For a few moments, we can take advantage of this opportunity to thank God for His blessings in our lives. And then to ask God that our offerings will be used to further His work and bring glory to His name. One of the uh, common complaints that is voiced following a worship service is, well, I didn't really get anything out of it today. Have you ever heard that? Have you ever said that? You don't have to acknowledge that. But it is true, isn't it? We tend to judge a worship service on the basis of what we get out of it. If the music stirred us, if the prayer touched our heart, if the sermon really spoke to us, if we thought the preacher was funny, then it was a good service and we're glad we came. On the other hand, if we don't get anything out of it, Well, then it was a poor service, a boring service, kind of a waste of time. To have that attitude is to view worship totally in the wrong light. I mean, to think that way is like attending a friend's birthday party. And at the end of the party, you leave upset because your friend got all the presents and you didn't get any. At a birthday party, you honor the one who's having the birthday. So, of course, they're the one who receives the gifts or who gets something out of it, if you will. We give our gifts to them. In worship, we come to honor God. We come to celebrate who God is and what God has done for us. God is the guest of honor. As we sang earlier, it's all about you, Jesus. It's all about you. We offer our gifts to Him. The gifts of worship and praise of which He is so worthy. By definition, worship is not about what we get out of it. Worship is about what we put into it. What we give to God. Now it is true, though, that often we do get something out of worship as we actively and intentionally worship God God graciously works in our lives renewing our spirits encouraging us in our faith drawing us closer to him and to one another broadening our understanding deepening our commitment enabling us to sense His presence and to experience His love, cleansing us, healing us, filling us with joy. True worship does contribute something powerfully and la- powerful and lasting to our lives. God graciously works in our lives as we worship. Often we do get something out of it. But what we get out of worship is secondary. The primary thing, what is to be our focus, is what we are putting into worship. We come to worship God. And if some Sundays we don't get anything out of it, and there probably will be some Sundays when we don't get anything out of it, as long as we have worshipped, as long as we have proclaimed the greatness of God, as long as we have expressed our thankfulness to God, as long as we have declared our love for God, then the worship service will have fulfilled its purpose. If we do that, if we 
actively worship God through all the elements of the worship service, then no worship service will ever be dull or boring. So let me encourage you to make every worship service exactly that, a service in which you worship God. Let us pray. Dear God, we praise you, we honor you, for you are God. We exalt you, for you are the creator of all. We adore you, for you are our Savior. We thank you for your mercy, your love, your grace. Lord, every time we gather for worship, please help us to actively worship you. To not just sit in the pew, but to engage our minds, to fully participate in every aspect of the service. Please help us to behold afresh the wonder of who you are and give you true worship from our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. When we behold the wonder of who God is and we realize that all all that in His love He has done for us, then our hearts, of course, will be filled with joy. And so with joyful hearts, let us worship as we sing together, joyful, joyful, we adore Thee. And let us stand as we sing and worship. <laughs>